this ad on Company. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I, you know, I was a, a semi-last-minute addition, so I was super stoked to be here because uh, I absolutely love um, this area, especially, and I really applaud what touring's doing. I really, really do. So, just out of curiosity, uh, raise your hand if you are a part of the touring family, some way, somehow. Okay, just if you haven't had a chance, look around. Um, and then when you have a chance, point your attention to somebody who helped make that possible, truly. And the team over here, I mean, really applaud that community that's been created, because it really is a fantastic thing, and it's a great, great thing. Yeah. So, uh, today what I want to talk about is the thing that uh, some of us appear to be blessed with, and others of us tend to fear more than life itself, and that's confidence. Nope. That's confidence. <laughs> so out of your curiosity, I, well, um, so as I understand it, this is the second day of course, well, I know it's the second day of course. Uh, now, raise your hand if you've been here both days so far. Okay, fantastic. So if you've been here both days, I didn't see, put your hand up. Your hand up, very good. Okay, now if you've been here both days, I want you to stand up if you have written code for, um, let, let's say a week or more. Week or more. Stand up if you've written code for a week or more. Okay. Well, you can put your hand down now. I feel like I want you to put your hand Okay, uh, I want you to stay standing if you've written code for uh, a month or more. Okay, fantastic. Uh, let's go for a year. A year or more. If you've written code for a year or more. Okay. Wow, still quite a few. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, uh, let's, let's go to two years. Okay, all right, still quite a few of you. This is very interesting. All right, let's go, let's jump, jump to five. Five years. Five years or more. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, 10 years or more? Wow, so 10 years or more, a decade or more. Uh, let's go 15 years or more. Okay, all right, so 15 years or more. People, 15 years or more. Now let me ask you, I want you to raise your hand if you feel like you've learned something over the last couple of days. Wow, that's amazing. Imposters! All of you! You mean to tell me that you learned something after 15 years in two days? Well, did you not know anything before that? This is absurd, 15 years. How is that possible? Haven't you had enough time? You write rails. <laughs> this is ridiculous. What do you do? Sit in a room and just for time the time pass and then come in and go, no, I know something, I swear. Come on, now, 15 years. This is this is ridiculous. You haven't had built all the confidence you need. You don't know everything at this point. You guys are all imposters. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Sit down, all of you. <laughs> this is unbelievable. 15 years. That's just astounding to me. Well, here's the thing. I've got a theory about confidence, and, and we'll, let's, we're going to test whether or not, over the next, of course, the next 35 minutes or so, whether or not my, my, my theory, my hypothesis holds any water whatsoever. My hypothesis is this, that confidence is not, is not, the result of belief in time. It is not. That's just what you feel, because that's the conscious side of it. But in fact, confidence is the result of ingrained habit and routine. The more habit you create, the more routine you create, the more likely you are to feel confident about it. So let me run another question by many of you, and you 15-year liars out there, imposters, as you think you are. I want to ask you a question. Of those of you who have written code for a year or more, um, or any of you for that matter, how many of you have formed a habit around how you place windows on the screen as you're writing code? Look around for a second. Almost all of you have formed a habit around that. Now, I venture to say that there's a degree of comfortability that happens as a result of that, right? You feel quite comfortable about it. I have another theory, which is it actually creates a side benefit, and that is confidence around things that are indirectly related. So about a year ago, our company, which were a consultancy, we brought on a couple of interns out of code school. Um, they had only, both of them coincidentally, had only written code in any way, shape, or form over the last three months. And so they were going through a one-month internship. And over the course of the first week, I was noticing a couple of interesting things, which was that they, they found themselves tripping up over things that they had experienced, oh gosh, probably a hundred or more times prior to that. And, and this isn't new, and so there's no blame or shame. I was just really curious by it, because at the same time, the same sort of error or instance might happen for somebody that had, let's say, more time, right? But they were tripping over the same thing. Now, they didn't know what the error meant all the time. They couldn't always jump to the right conclusion and fix that thing. But 
they had a routine that they kept following. And so I found it really curious to me, and so we tried to experiment with this a little bit. And I wanted to see, was there anything that had any kind of side correlation? And what I noticed was something that I thought was interesting, but couldn't quite tie the two together. And that was that I noticed that those that had less time or experience working their code, their windows were just all over the place. Scattered messes. Some were new windows, some were tabs, some were behind other things. And so they had no context at any point in time. I asked the same question and looked at our team and was like, for those of you, for those of them who had spent more time, right, and looked and see, well, what were the things that they had in common? And this was one of those things, that they had a routine. They had a habit behind the placement of objects on the screen. Going even a step further, they had a habit around the color in their editor. They had, if they were a Vim or an Emacs user or any of that kind, they had a habit around their key bindings. And the moment any of that got thrown off, it was like you could have blown up the planet, everything was over. Right? If any of you have any association to writing Rails, <laughs> I'm curious what happens in the community when you change a publicly available method. It's crazy. It's just like all of a sudden Rails doesn't work. The whole thing is blown up and I have to go back to, uh, to ground zero again. Because what we do is we create habit around things. We create habit around these things. So, on one side of the coin, you can say, well, habit is dangerous because it locks us in dogmatically in the process. But there's another side of the coin, which is, can we use it to our benefit? Can we do something with it that amplifies our effectiveness, allows us to expedite the learning curve, and be more impactful and more powerful and ultimately more confident in what we do, even with less time, right? So time just becomes corollary and not causal. Now, this is something you can see time and time again. So for those of you who don't know, I'm not a sports ball person, but this sports ball player, <laughs> Steph Curry, is one of the best, if not the best, basketball players in history. And recently, it was, well, at the time of the talk, it was recent, but now it's been, uh, he had given, he was on a streak to beat the 40, uh, the free throw, excuse me, the continuous, <laughs> <laughs> There was sports ball. He was going to get the sports ball in the round thingy in the net part <laughs> consistently from the consistent line 40, 49 or more times. And as he was coming up on that, uh, on that record, he was asked the question, do you ever get nervous? Do you feel it? And his response was really quite simple. Or not. Honestly, the past game is the first time I've actually thought about it. Since I haven't missed one, it's on my mind. I'm going to be more laser focused on the mechanics and the rhythm of shooting free throws until the streak is over. It wasn't, oh, I just got to think harder in the corner and I'll be fine. Right? It was like, no, no, no. I've got a process, I have a habit, and I'm going to follow through with that consistently. I don't know if you heard this, but uh, recently here in 2018, uh, this woman had, uh, you notice that uh, her name is uh, Tammy, Tammy Jo Schultz, and she was a fighter pilot one of the first Navy fighter pilots ever introduced into the Corps. And at the time, uh, she had spent a lot of time in the Naval Reserve. And after she had retired, she had joined Southwest Airlines. And last year, Southwest Airlines had a really interesting thing happen, which was quite unfortunate, but really fascinating what resulted in it. And that was that on the left side of the plane, the engine had blown up, causing shrapnel to shoot through the plane, creating a hole, depressurizing the entire cabin of the plane. So the plane started to go down for obvious reasons, and she, as the captain of that, uh, of that plane, had to get that thing landed safely. Now, if you haven't had the chance, go online and listen to the flight recording. It's one of the most fascinating things possible. Now, unfortunately, what most people comment about is how calm she sounds. What I find so amazing is how calm she sounds, <laughs> right? I mean, she's got a literal hole in the side of the plane, an engine totally down, uh, reports of somebody having been sucked out and possibly dead, and she has an entire passenger uh, a manifest of people that have got to make it safely to the ground. That's her job. Get them to the ground safely. And if you listen to the recording, what you hear is something I find very boring, yet really fascinating, and that is a consistent routine through the process. There's no emotion. It's just the practice. Same thing applied. Now, when asked, what did she feel about it? Oh, and here's an image of it, by the way. Yeah, just imagine sitting that to the left. In fact, I was flying, when I was flying out here, I was in the seat that had that view on a southwest flight and thinking, woo, okay. <laughs> yeah, as I'm writing the talk, so I'm the guy next to me. It's 1 a.m., I've got to go, like, it's 1 a.m., I have this slide on the screen. <laughs> and that's our angle. Yeah, on a southwest flight, yeah. 
<laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. She said this, we knew from our training and took the knowledge that we had, pooled it, and used our system knowledge, and it worked well. That was the response to it. The third is this gentleman, his name's Aunt Alex Honnold. Now, again, I'm, this is a climber. He's a world-renowned climber, climber, arguably one of the best, if not the best in the world. Um, and in 2017, he did something that was really astounding. Now, this here is El Capitan in Yosemite. And El Capitan is a 3,000-foot sheer granite cliff um, on all sides. It's basically one large sheet of glass, is what it is, on all sides. It's known in the rock climbing industry as the pinnacle, the, the crown jewel of rock climbing, because of its sheer challenge. Now, I don't know how many of you, raise your hand if you're a rock climber at all. Okay, so there's a handful of you out there. I did not know this, but what I had learned recently was that rock climbing difficulty is rated on a various scale, where anything above a number of five, so five point so-and-so, is considered world class. That is a five ten and above, for the most part. So climbing it is, by, by all accords, impossible for most people. That's what it feels like or sentence like. Now here's what's wild, this is 2017, so just a year and a half ago, he did it free solo, which means he had no ropes or safety gear, gear with him. 3,000 foot, the most difficult climb known in the rock climbing industry, and he did it without any safety gear. He's about 2,000 feet up right here. Now, what uh, recently, and this is why I'm bringing it up, is there was a documentary made by National Geographic, and it just won the Academy Award. If you haven't seen it, watch it. Because I found something to be so fascinating, which was the topic of risk. So the way that this gets climbed is things are mapped out. So what's felt, and actually let's find out. Raise your hand if you thought when you heard that somebody free sold this that they were batshit crazy. Right? I venture to say that the reason why you define it as such is because the thought comes to mind of like, why would you ever just climb up like that? Right? Like, why would you just do it? <laughs> Well, the reality is that's not how that happens, right? He had climbed these routes more than 40 times. This is totally familiar terrain to him. On top of that, he had trained with the other individuals that were even more well-renowned uh, well for climbing this rock face. Now, what he did, and, and the way rock climbing works as far as mapping, is that you map a terrain, a climb, and it's very much mapped. And what you do is you rate it by what's called a pitch, and a pitch is an extension of rope. Okay? So you have pitches that are effectively journeys from A to B to C, you know, C, D, and so on and so forth. And they're rated and, 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 and whatnot. But they're treated just like a map you would on you know, walking down the street here. But vertical and sheer. <laughs> now what was awesome about it was there's a chunk called the boulder problem, and it's pitch 29. So very hot. We're about 2,000 plus feet at this point. And it's called the Boulder Problem because it's considered the hardest of the whole route. And this is a free rider. There's many different routes on this rock face. It's very, very large. But the one they chose is called free rider. And there's this chunk called the Boulder Problem. Now, here's the thing with the Boulder Problem is there's two options. And he's going to go over. And I'm going to show a video right now where he's processing how to get through the Boulder Problem. problem. And I want you to pay very close attention to two things, neither of which are he's 2,000 feet in the air. The first is, listen to the language, the words that get used, and the mental processing that's happened to account for risk, and then the process of uh, determining whether or not one option over the other makes the most sense. But the boulder problem has a 10-foot section that's incredibly difficult. It's a very intricate sequence. You've got your right hand on a crimp, left hand on a side pole, and then you put your right foot onto this dimple thing. Right hand goes up to a small down point crimp. Left foot goes into a little dish. And then you drive up off the left foot into the thumb press. That's the worst hole in the entire route. So you get maybe half your thumb on a hold. <laughs> then you roll your two fingers over the thumb. Switch your feet. Left foot stems out this really bad sloping black foothold. Switch your thumbs. <laughs> and then reach out left to a big sloping red loaf type hole that feels kind of green. <sighs> From there, either karate kick or double dino to an edge on the opposite wall. In some ways, it makes more sense to do the big two handed jump because you're jumping to a good edge, so there's actually something to catch. <laughs> Yeah. 
But the idea of jumping without a rope seems completely outrageous. If you miss it, that's that. Now, if you haven't seen the documentary, it'll make you pucker like that. <laughs> and I can't say I walked away to keep you with any less that shit crazy. But what I was blown away by, and the documentary is full of this, is detailed explanations as to how to mechanically do the route. It wasn't go up a little bit, kind of to the right, and you know, if it feels precarious, go a little more to the left. Um, in an interview that he had in one of the late night talk shows, he was asked, you know, how planned is it? And the answer was extremely rehearsed, so much so that the 3,000 foot vertical ascension was every single hand motion was totally planned. In fact, in the documentary, he shows a climbing notebook where he quite literally writes out every hand position that he's going to have the entire route up. Right? So, on top of that, at the end of the documentary, it says this thing that I think really hits everything on the head for me, which is expand my, expand my comfort zone and work through the fear by practicing the moves over and over again until it's just not scary anymore. There's always something that has to give, give you the confidence. Sometimes the confidence comes through preparation and rehearsal. So, in the free soloing world, and I've come to realize this, it's, it's one of the only representations where perfection is almost a thing because the alternative is almost certain death. So to be able to do it and to achieve it is almost a representation of perfection. The question is, is, is perfection the derivative of your ability to believe that you are perfect or is it the derivative of many other factors that are in fact planned and prepared? And in the case of this, I think it's very clear that it's that. So I'll say it again, that confidence is not the result of belief in time. Now, we talk about it that way, we often refer to it that way, but I think you'll consistently find that if you sort of dig into those people that appear, either feel or don't feel confident, one way or the other, you're going to start to notice that what is consistent amongst all of them is their routine, whatever that happens to be. Now, that's not to say that their routine is perfect, that's okay, but more that they have one, and that routine is there. So if you want to expedite that curve, that's a recommendation. Now. I'll prove it to you that routine matters and that it helps kind of keep the monkey mind out of the way. So, how many of you have ever driven a car? Okay, quite a few of you. See, we've got this hand raising thing down. Very good, very effective. I love it. Okay. Now, if you're like me, when I started when I was 16 years old driving a car, I mean, yes, I watched my parents and friends and family and whatnot drive a car a thousand times. I, I had an idea for how it worked, but I'll tell you what, the first time I was in that car, uh, and I, had, I mean, I was white knuckled, gripping that thing. I don't know if you were like me, but I was freaked out. My confidence was about that big, right? At least that was for me. Maybe not for you, but it definitely was for me. So this was when I was 16. I'm in my, my mid-30s now. And a couple of years back, I was actually going to visit a good friend of mine, Nadia, over here to the left, or D3 Bug, as you uh, commonly refer to now these days. And this happened. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just went back 20 years of my life to that moment when I was pretty certain I was going to die. Yeah. Now, but here's what's interesting about confidence, and here's what's really fascinating about routine. And I would imagine this happens whenever you change something up in an editor or you're learning a new code base is instantly what, you're, what your brain will do is it will take prior experiences, it will layer them over top one another, similar to how Tammy Jo explained bringing together experiences from her naval training and her Southwest training, and then the team's experience, bringing them together, and what you start to discover is you start to find out what's the same and what's different. So you look at this, and it's like, well, the brain quickly goes, well, what's the same? The same is the wheel functions the same way, the dials um, and dashboard is effectively the same. Uh, accelerator, uh, you know, clutch, all of those are effectively the same. I mean, even the dashboard controls are the same. They're just on the other side, but they're still the same. And this auditing process that the brain goes through is pretty rapid. If you can get exceptionally good at acknowledging that and running that process, how to filter those two together, then you're going to find that you can expedite the learning curve. And you can shorten that quite, quite dramatically. And in the case of this, I didn't die. Here I am today. This is quite nice, right? Now, there's a, a gentleman that you may or may not have heard of. His name is Eugene Pollock. So here's the deal with Eugene. Is, uh, he was 59 years old in the late 50s. And Eugene uh, had traveled abroad, and while he was abroad, he had contracted this bacteria that 
had caused a condition that damaged a part of his brain that controlled short-term memory. So from, it was 1960, I believe, was the year, but he was 59 and a half, that's the part I know for sure. So from that point forward, he had no idea more than 90 seconds had passed. He had zero short-term memory. Now, of course, as time progresses in an individual ages, there's a lot of things that you kind of have to remember. In his case, that his daughter had children and grandkids. Well, because he had no short-term memory, he never knew that she had kids. So every time they would come over, it was like a fresh new 90-second cycle. But here's what they discovered started to be quite interesting and really unfortunate at the same time was every time that she would leave, he would get frustrated because he felt like she had just got there. Like, where is she going? She just got here. Because he had no memory of longer than 90 seconds. Now, what was fascinating about it was that you'd think if he didn't have a memory longer than 90 seconds, that his level of little anxiety and his level of frustration would effectively be relatively the same every time, right? But it wasn't. Progressively, it got worse. His frustration grew over time. So neuroscientists started to beat this up a little bit, trying to analyze, like, why would that be the case? If he had no memory, why would he have emotional kind of cognition limited towards that? Like, why would that happen? And what they discovered was this, that the brain has two very distinct areas that control short-term and long-term memory. Think about it like RAM and hard drive, right, and the standard hard drive. So short-term memory gets locked into place, and what happens is the brain treats it as, as obviously very rapid access, but it's very conscious access. It's stuff that you think about, you can, very, you can very quickly access, and then there's another portion of the brain that kind of lives in the zone of the long term. What they discovered was this, that the repetition of his daughter coming and going, and the emotion associated to it, was migrating from what would be considered short-term memory in his brain to long-term memory. He was basically, there was a habit that was forming around his daughter leaving time and time and time again. And he had emotions that were bound to that. Now, later, a little later on, as he started to age, doctors were concerned about his health, and they wanted to look at, well, how can we sort of change some eating habits and patterns? Because the problem was, he had a habit that sort of sucked, and it was this. His habit was that he would get up in the morning, after his alarm went off, he'd walk into the kitchen, he'd make bacon and eggs, he'd eat it, make a cup of coffee, drink it, and go back to bed. Then what would happen? they wake up, go into the kitchen, make bacon and eggs. He'd do it three or four times before the sun got so high that he assumed that he just slept in too long. So they started to look at what could we do? What could we change? What they found was curious about the kitchen scenario is that even after he had moved, he and his wife had moved to an entirely new place, that even though he would have no conscious memory of the kitchen, like he couldn't tell you where in the house it was even located, he sure as heck couldn't give you a map of it, and he couldn't tell you where the eggs were in comparison to the refrigerator, right? He could walk in every single time, every single time. And so the same thing applied. The habit and routine would, would move themselves and kind of circumvent what would commonly happen, which is move into short-term memory and then migrate their way into long-term memory. So this is something that we can do for ourselves. That there are things that we do every single day, habits and routines that are either consciously caused by ourselves or things that are happening around us, that we can then use to our advantage. So in other words, if you want to be better at something, even if you don't feel confident about it now, you can instill a habit that will put you down, down a path in where you have created a rehearsal of a routine so that the fear and the scare, uh, the feeling of, not scarcity, but the fear that you have around it starts to go away and dissipate. Okay? So here's what this looks like, and this is how you can do this. So the first thing is obviously to create a routine. So creating a routine is simple. Word of caution, don't make it complicated. Make it really easy, right? Make it something that is easy to digest, easy to understand, something that you can do for yourself time and time and time again, right? Whatever that happens to be. But similarly, don't make it so vague and so, and so broad that it's not something that has any, anything that you can bind it to. So as an example, if you said, my routine is I want to eat every day, that doesn't really do you any good. But if your routine is I'm going to eat at 11.03 every morning, and I want to eat again at 142, you might be getting so specific that you just simply can't maintain it. But you can create a routine that creates the result that you'd like to have. The next is find a trigger and reward. So the reward part is something that either you consciously create for yourself or is thrust upon you. And here's what I mean by that. Is that in the routine habit model, there's always going to be a reward on the other end that keeps you committed to that routine or habit. It will exist. Again, whether you consciously choose for it to be or otherwise. Now, unfortunately, this is where some forms of addiction can come from, or at least it can contribute to that, 
right? Which is that we create a habit around, let's say, taking a smoke break as an example, or um, over, you know, eating everything on the plate versus just eating until I'm full, right? Whatever that happens to be. But you might have a habit associated to one thing that puts you down the wrong path. The reward is the success at the end, right? The break, or, uh, you know, you know, uh, feeling full and successful, whatever that happens to be, right? But if you can create the trigger of the reward that binds to something that is good for you, right? So if I replace, let's say, taking a smoke break with taking a walk and calling my, you know, spouse or partner or, you know, a good friend of mine or whatever, what have not, or what you, or what not, um, then you can start to create a new trigger and a new routine that feeds a better habit that puts you down a better path. You can do the same thing in, inside of all the other things that you do. Um, in software development or engineering as well. The next is following the plan. So clearly if you don't do it, then it's pretty much inevitable that it won't consist consistently happen. So here's the thing that I personally discovered is that if confidence is the result of ingrained habit and routine, then commitment is the choice. So if you don't commit to it, then it doesn't matter. It's all for naught, for the most part, right? Now as team leaders, this is the thing that uh, whether we realize it or not, we're often trying to help and instill in our teams when we provide support to them is, how can we make your life easier? And if we create a routine where every time you have a problem, I will solve it for you, we've created the wrong trigger, the wrong reward. But if I support you by helping you create the trigger and reward, and you developing the routine that meets the goal you want to have, then I'm effectively kind of you know, teaching a person to fish versus just giving them fish, right? So the same kind of rules and principles can apply. So for you team leaders that are out there, think about that. If you're just filling the hole, filling the void, you're gonna create probably the wrong trigger and reward and the wrong routine, something that doesn't ultimately serve your team very well. But if you can encourage them and empower them to do that for themselves, then once they do it, obviously, they have a greater success. So what happened, okay? And the last and so commonly overlooked, which is just celebrate it. Celebrate all the failure, celebrate all the success, celebrate it. We are, we are people that are emotionally driven by and large. And if we start to associate a trigger or, the, or a negative reward to something, then we're more likely to move away from it than towards it, okay? So if you as a team leader and you as an individual celebrate things as much as possible. Um, this is actually a common strategy with runners that are trying to meet particular times. And the strategy is First, break the pattern. So if they're on a track and they're trying to, let's say, beat their, their personal best and they're on a track, one of the first steps is get them off that track. Put them onto a totally different track, disrupt the pattern so that you can create a new one, right? And the other one is don't define the end line to them, right? So instead, if uh, a trainer might choose a different approach, which is I know where the end line is and I'll tell you when you beat it, but until that point, I want you to focus on doing your best, running your hardest, or whatever, what, whatnot, right? So we can decouple the two from one another, and so we create a new reward and a new habit that goes along with it, okay? And then we can celebrate when we succeed. And then, of course, the last step, or maybe not, of course, but the last step is to refine and iterate. You can always change it, right? Um, the most important part is that there is a routine or habit, whatever that happens to be. Um, so if we don't have it, then it's more likely that we're not going to start to build on those experiences. We're not going to continually improve where we were. Instead, where we'll just end up is, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, and hopefully our mind figures a way to bring it all together. And that's the part that we don't want to have happen as much as possible. If we can consciously do it, then we can kind of put our focus and energy into the thing that really makes it work. And so if we refine it and iterate it, continually make it better, then we're going to be in that position to make that win. Okay. So, there's another factor to all of this, which is how can we expedite this curve? So, even though I don't believe that time is directly associated to it, experiences are. So how can we shrink this element, right? How can we make this happen a little bit faster for all of us? So, let, let's run something, and, and if you've seen this before, I, I'm gonna ask you not to participate, but if you haven't, then this should be fun. So, I'm gonna get, let, let's try an experiment around perspective context, okay? So I'm going to show you three symbols, and I want you to tell me what three numbers these represent. Anybody? How about the first one? Two, okay? One? Seven, okay? Okay, I'll help you out, right? We're, we're learning what? No? Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Let me help you out. Okay, so I want you to really capture this, okay? These three. These are three individual numbers. There's no trick to that. It's three, truly 
three numbers, one through nine, okay? Three numbers, here you go, capture in your head, get ready. There's your key, okay? You got it? You got the three numbers now? Okay, all right, ready? What number is it? <laughs> okay, let's try this again. There's only nine of them, and we're only dealing with lines and partial like circles here, so let's try this again, ready? There you go, there's your key. I'm sorry, let me help you out a little bit. How about I give you a touch of perspective? Okay, yeah. how about now? What's the number? Why are you so fast? This is amazing, how about that number? This is astounding, this is amazing. 724, I mean, wow, can you believe how fast you learned that? That this is astounding, right? So if I was to show you that again, how quickly do you think you'd catch it? Right fast, right? Okay, so here's the important thing is perspective provides, expedites the curve. That's what expedites the experience, right? So it's super important whenever we're learning something new that we understand why something is the way that it is. I find that this is one of the most valuable things that comes from reading source code. It's just I can start to understand why something is the way that it is. I don't have to agree or disagree with it, but it helps me give some context and perspective to that decision. Similarly, one of the most powerful things that a team, a software development team can do is write really comprehensive, context-aware Git commit messages. Because this can give the narrative to why something is the way that it is. And it expedites that curve. It allows us to learn something more quickly and more rapidly instead of just saying, oh no, that's just the way that it is. So more recently, we, uh, we have a new set of interns that are working with our company, and we're building out this um, simple uh, like initiative tracker uh, as their project. But we, we're really cautious of the fact that we wanted to try and fit as much as much of the project into the four-week span as we could. We didn't want to sort of like leave them sort of stuck. But we had this interesting situation, which was we had user accounts, and we were curious as to whether or not they had enough information around, you know, how to integrate either device or some sort of authentication model to be able to allow them to do that. And so we ran into this real interesting thing where like, well, if they don't know it, what rabbit hole might they end up going down, and what do we do about that? And so the idea came up, well, does it really matter that it's devised and authentication? Like, what if we just had a bunch of unique URLs for at least the time being, and then we could blow that up and slide something else in its place? What happened really fast was we realized that there was almost, all of that context had to be relayed because immediately once we started to institute that as the team, they ended up down a whole different set of rabbit holes. Right? Because there wasn't any context as to why one decision over the other. So the same thing can apply. So think about this again, whether you're on a team or whether you're pairing with somebody or you're on a team, is to remember that context is so powerful because it really expedites that, um, that, uh, that experience. Okay, so I've said this a million times, but I'll say it again. So results, or confidence is the result of successful routine, and commitment is the choice. So we commit to it, more likely, well, it's the only possibility, it's the only conscious choice that we're going to have to make to follow through with it. Um, and the more we can do that consciously, the more that you as team leaders can inspire your teams or your pair to be able to do that better for themselves, all the gooder for them. Now, I have a, a survey that if you are open to it, I would love your participation in. But I'm not, not going to send you a bunch of stuff, but I'm very curious as to what is it that you do to feel confident. So if you could write this down, and at some point in time, it's short, it's less than five minutes. And I just asked some simple questions about what are some routines and habits that you have? Maybe what are some things that you'd like to improve in your life? And if you have questions about that, you can definitely find me online as well, and we can go through some of that stuff. Now, like I said, I work for a company called Zeal, and we're a consultancy, web and mobile applications consultancy, and what we primarily do is we work with teams to instill confidence into their process. So we don't replace teams, we don't do projects on the side with the teams that we work with. It's, we want to work really harmoniously with them to really address these topics. But the last thing I want to do with you is this. Okay, so I want all of you to stand up for a second for me. Okay, and I want you to find a partner. Find a partner. Left, right, side, behind you. If you don't have a partner, move around a little bit. If you need to be a, a trio of partners, 
Parker here, that's great. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to give each other a high five, a really good high five. Okay, so I want you to be honest. I want you to raise your hand if you felt like you sucked at giving a high five. Okay, so. Okay, so I want you to raise your hand if you felt your partner sucked at giving a high five. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna teach you how to give a stellar high five. Do it again, but this time look at their elbow. Really?